good to go. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much. So yeah, thank you again for the invitation uh, to talk in the webinar series. I'm, I'm really excited to be part of the Scottish marine science community now. I say that although I'm still in Canada, so I'm not physically there, uh, but I am looking forward to when I'll actually get a chance to come over. I did start in April as a new lecturer in marine biology at the University of Aberdeen. And my research program is quite diverse, but today I'm gonna to talk about some of my postdoc work that's used genomics to predict climate change response in marine species. And before I kind of start diving into the goods, I just thought I'd give a little bit of an introduction. This is a little bit unorthodox for me when I would give a seminar to actually give a personal introduction, but again, most of you won't know who I am. And so I think it's important to give you some sort of idea of my background and my research interests. So as Hannah mentioned in her introduction, um, thank you for that also, it was really nice. Uh, I'm quite interested in just marine biodiversity as a whole. So sort of looking all the way from the ecosystem level down to the genetic level. And I am Canadian. I did my bachelor's and master's degrees at the University of Guelph, um, a very strange name. It's a university that's located near Toronto, Ontario. Uh, but during this time while I was at Guelph, I got quite involved with the International Barcode of Life Project and trying to understand DNA barcode variation in marine invertebrates. Then for my PhD, I moved overseas to Perth where I did, uh, did this at the University of Western Australia and the Western Australian Museum with Dr. Narada Wilson. And during this time, I was really interested in investigating molecular systematics and evolution in marine gastropods, uh, mostly in the Indo-Pacific and Antarctica. And then for my postdoc, I moved back to Canada to Halifax this time where um, I worked at Memorial University and with Fisheries and Oceans Canada. And this is the work that I'm gonna be talking about uh, for most of today. But my research program in general really uses both field and museum collections along with genetic tools to really investigate broad scale patterns of biodiversity and to identify the processes that are really generating and maintaining this diversity. Uh, as I mentioned, I have pretty broad research interests. I've sort of summarized some of them here. Um, I'm, I'm really excited to kind of build new collaborations. So if there's anything here that you think aligns with your work and, and ways that we could work together, I'd be really interested in getting in contact. Uh, of course, again, I'm new to the Scottish marine science community and my interests are quite broad. Um, but as I said, I'm really focused on marine biodiversity. I've always been fascinated by it, just by the sheer number of species in our oceans alone. But unfortunately, we also know that marine biodiversity is impacted by things like climate change and anthropogenic activities. So if we look at things like increasing temperature, we know that coral bleaching and ice melt are having really negative effects. Um, we know that ocean acidification is causing huge problems for shell building um, animals, including these pelagic mollusks you can see at the, at the sort of top of the slide here. And then we also know that climate change is facilitating the spread of invasive species. So things like crown of thorns, sea stars and lionfish are having devastating impacts on coral reefs. Uh, we also know that marine pollution and overfishing continue to be issues and uh, mangrove deforestation as well is actually a, a really massive issue. So we know that all of these impacts are contributing to the global biodiversity crisis. The idea that we're really losing species before we're able to document them. So if we look at the percent of the remaining indigenous species on our planet, this is um, data that comes from the British Natural History Museum. We can see that areas in red have lost nearly 50% of the species that are native to that region. And so that's obviously a massive concern. There's a lot of red on this map. And as I said before, biodiversity is quite fascinating, but we also know that it's really important. So there's this interesting paper by Boris Worm and colleagues in 2006, and they discuss and document a variety of different ways in which biodiversity loss is impacting marine ecosystem service and function. Uh, it's a really great paper if you haven't had a chance to, to uh, read it. One thing I pulled from that paper I thought that was interesting is the idea that fisheries actually collapse quicker in areas that are species poor. So we know that species richness, the number of species and biodiversity is really essential for ecosystem service and function. Now, I think when we think about biodiversity, it's quite diverse in itself. Uh, we know there are different levels of diversity. So we can look at say ecosystem diver diversity where we're actually looking at the physical diversity of different habitats in our oceans. So maybe comparing say kelp forests to coral reefs. 
uh, we can take a more detailed approach and try to understand species diversity. So the number and types of species within just a single ecosystem or a single community. And then lastly, we can take sort of the most fine scale approach to understanding genetic diversity. So actually looking at diversity within a species or even within a single population within a species. And this uh, particular uh, level of diversity is quite interesting with respect to climate change because we know that genetic variation really drives adaptive potential and the ability of a species to really respond to environmental change. So I hope I've sort of convinced you that biodiversity is important. I, you know, as biologists, I think we're all interested in biodiversity in one shape or another. Um, but really to preserve this biodiversity, we do need to understand how species will respond to climate change. And so this is um, gonna be the bulk of what I'm actually talking about today. So, when we think about climate change response and climate change vulnerability in this sort of area of science, we know that ecological niche modeling and things like species distribution modeling have been really important. So um, in this paper, for example, by Vale and colleagues, but there are many other great examples, um, they're trying to predict what the future suitable habitat or future suitable conditions will look like for a species. Um, and in this case, they were looking at birds and Atlantic forests but essentially showing that between the current and the future distribution, we're losing um, areas of suitable habitat. Uh, and there's a really incredible wealth of research um, using these sort of ec uh, ecological niche models to do this work. But over the past few years, we've seen a few papers pop up in the literature that have suggested that we need to start considering genomic data and really adaptive genetic variation in trying to understand the climate change response and vulnerability. Um, these are a few papers that came to my mind immediately, but there are many others. And, the basis for this argument is the idea that populations are locally adapted. So across the whole range of a species, populations may respond differently to environmental change. So it's really important that we are considering this in sort of an evolutionary framework. And so the work I'm gonna be talking about today has done just this. We've used genomic data uh, combined with some machine learning approaches to try to understand how Arctic char have and will respond to climate change in the future. Now, before I get into the details of this project, I wanna take a second just to thank all of my co-authors and collaborators on this work. Um, they're from kind of a variety of different Canadian institutions and they've been absolutely instrumental in seeing this work come to fruition. I especially wanna thank my postdoc supervisors, Ian Bradbury and Paul Snellgrove. Um, and again, the, the work today is going to be focused on Arctic char. Um, you may have noticed from my introductory slide, I have spent most of my time working on marine invertebrates, and this was kind of a recent dive into the fish world, and I've really enjoyed it. Um, the Salmonid community has been incredible, and it's uh, been really great to work on Arctic char, so hoping to keep this work going into the future. But Arctic char are... Um, economically and ecologically important in Canada. I'm sure a lot of you on this call probably know a lot about Arctic char more than I probably do, to be honest. Um, but we, we know that it does make up the basis of important commercial, recreational, and subsistence fisheries in Canada. And we were interested in looking at Arctic char populations in northeastern Canada, so Newfoundland and Labrador. Um, I've just highlighted that on a map of Canada here. I'm sure most people are familiar with where Newfoundland and Labrador are, but I have given talks in other regions where that may not be the case. So I always like to point, point out where it is on a map. And we're really interested in this area. It's a really unique part of Canada. Um, and we looked at 28 anadromous populations of Arctic char across this range. So the map that you're looking at here, this is mostly Labrador. And in the bottom right-hand corner, that's just the northern tip of Newfoundland down here. So that's actually the southern range limit for the anadromous form of Arctic char in Canada. And what you'll notice is I've actually mapped um, mean annual temperature onto this map. So you can see down where it's green on the map, it's much warmer, and then it gets much cooler as you go into northern Labrador. So again, it's a really unique area because it has these steep environmental gradients where it varies from wet boreal forest in the south to kind of cold uh, Arctic tundra in the north. So it forms a really interesting area to be looking at sort of genotype environment relationships across a climb. 
So to start looking at these genotype environment relationships, I had data from about 16 and a half thousand polymorphic genome-wide SNPs or single nucleotide polymorphisms. I also had environmental data for uh, the current time period. So to extract this environmental data, I went to the World Climate database. So this is a, a database of global climate data. And the 19 environmental variables that you can get from this database are different sort of temperature and precipitation variables. Uh, so things like mean annual temperature, annual precipitation, maximum temperature of the warmest quarter, et cetera. And with the genotype and the environmental data, I ran a redundancy analysis which is just a constrained form of ordination. Um, it gives us some idea about how much of the genomic variation is explained by environment. So in this case, the genotype data are your response variables and your environmental data are your predictor variables. And if we look at the results of, of this redundancy analysis, uh, what we can see is that on that first axis on RDA1, populations are really ordered by latitude. So we have our northernmost populations to the left of that plot where it's sort of yellow and green, and then our southernmost populations to the right of the plot where it becomes more red. And what we were interested in doing with this redundancy analysis was pulling out the SNPs that were loading most heavily on that first axis, RDA1. Uh, so we know that the first axis explains most of the variation. In this case, it was about 80% of the variation. And I wanted to pull out um, these SNPs, which we're calling our environmentally associated SNPs, or what you'll hear is called outlier SNPs as well. And I've just marked those in red. And the plot that you're looking at here with the gray and red dots, uh, along the X axis, it's really difficult to see, but these are actually all the different chromosomes in the Arctic tar genome. So all I wanted to show is just that these environmentally associated SNPs or these outlier SNPs are really distributed across the whole genome. The next thing I was interested in doing was trying to look at where these SNPs were located in terms of the genes that they were located near. And we find that they're located near genes that are involved in things like protein modification, cardiac muscle contraction, and lipid metabolism. And that was quite interesting because in the literature over the last few years, it's suggested that these particular processes and functions have been really important for climate adaptation, not only in other salmonids, but actually in fish more broadly. So with this set of environmentally associated SNPs, I then wanted to calculate something that's called genomic vulnerability. Now, Normally when I've presented this talk, um, it's at a conference and I only have 10 minutes. So I haven't been <laughs> able to really uh, dive deep into vulnerability and dissect it to give people a true understanding of what it is. Um, so I'm gonna try to do that for you here without getting too messy into the details, but just providing you with sort of a simple uh, pipeline. So genomic vulnerability, um, was first coined, the term was first coined by Rachel Bay and her colleagues in a paper in Science in 2018, which you can see at the very top of this slide. And this paper is sort of based on concepts and methodologies from this other paper by Fitzpatrick and Keller in 2015. So if you're interested in looking at genomic vulnerability, these two papers are, are really crucial and, and important for doing so. Um, the definition of genomic vulnerability is the magnitude of mismatch between the current genetic variation and future environmental change or future environmental conditions. Now, often um, it can be quite a misleading term because genomic vulnerability is not suggesting that we're looking at vulnerability of the genome. It's just that we're using genetic data to make inferences about population vulnerability. It's also called genetic offset. You might see that. I find that in the literature, both terms are actually used and that term genetic offset was actually used in this original paper by Fitzpatrick and Keller in 2015. So I'm just gonna go through a really simple pipeline. Um, I'm not getting, again, too deep dive into um, the modeling aspect, but I'm, I'm happy to chat about this anytime. Please feel free to reach out. I will say that the Fitzpatrick and Keller paper on Dryad, they had a lot of really helpful information, data, scripts, all of that, that were really instrumental in, um, in me actually creating, creating these scripts and doing this work myself. So first we start out with our genotype data, which again are those environmentally associated or those outlier SNPs that I showed you on the previous slide uh, that were highlighted in red. 
We then have our environmental data for the current environment, again, that I mentioned from the previous slide that I had extracted from World Climb. So with this genotype and this environment data, I then model the current genotype environment relationship using gradient forest machine learning. Now, um, I'm not sure how many people are familiar with gradient forest or random forest, so I'll just give a really quick breakdown of what that is. Uh, random forest machine learning is a decision tree based algorithm. So the idea is that you're running hundreds of different independent decision trees and the prediction of the model is really an average of the prediction of all of these independent decision trees. So it's a really powerful machine learning approach. Uh, Random Forest has a lot of different applications and we're seeing it used a lot more in our field in terms of a, an outlier analysis. Uh, Gradient Forest is really just a derivative of Random Forest. Gradient Forest is ideal for uh, finding breaks and sort of continuous uh, environmental variables. So that's why we've used that here. So now we have an idea or our basis of our current genotype environment relationships. And the next thing I did was then extract uh, future environmental data. So again, going back to that World Climb database, you can take environmental data and, and values for the year 2050. What's also great is not only can you get future environmental data for these same 19 environmental variables, but you can actually get this data for each of the different, sorry, for each of the different climate scenarios. Uh, so for those who aren't familiar with what these different uh, RCP scenarios are. We have RCP 2.6, 4.5, 6, and 8.5. And these are different representative concentration pathways. So basically reflecting different CO2 emissions. Um, the idea being that RCP 2.6 is sort of the least severe climate change scenario. And then on the other end of that, RCP 8.5 is the most severe climate change scenario. So what I've done then is I have a vulnerability value for each of these scenarios for each population because I wanted to see how these patterns changed among these different um, emissions scenarios. So I have a model of the current genotype environment relationships and I have future environmental data. So the next thing I did was then transform current environmental values and transform future environmental values based on our gradient forest model. And it's really the distance or the difference between these current and future values that represents genomic vulnerability. So your, your result is a single value for vulnerability. And again, as I mentioned, I repeated this analysis under each of those different um, RCP scenarios. So I have four values of vulnerability for each of the 28 populations that we were looking at in our study. So again, um, I, I kind of just touched on this. I haven't gone into too much detail, but it is quite simple to do in R if anyone's interested. Um, hopefully I'll have scripts available on GitHub in the not so distant future. So just to give you some idea of what our kind of vulnerability values look like for the 28 populations in our study, um, I've just plotted it on a map here. So first, before I discuss the data, I'll just say that um, what I've plotted across the map, you can tell it looks pretty colorful, is essentially just summer temperature. I plotted maximum temperature of the warmest month. And you can see that um, sort of inland and into Western Labrador, it's much warmer than the rest of the province. And then the data points you're seeing here, so data points that are larger or that are sort of more purple or red in color are our more vulnerable populations. And the data points that are much smaller um, and, and blue in color are, are uh, less vulnerable. So what we can see is that our two southernmost populations appear to be most vulnerable. And then we see another kind of blip of vulnerability in the, in the middle of the range. What I also did was look at the relationship between vulnerability and latitude here. And what we see is that as latitude increases, uh, so as we go more northward, populations become less vulnerable. Now, as I mentioned before, I repeated this for each of the different RCP scenarios. Um, but here, I'm not going to show you all four. I just want to show you the most severe scenario. But the pattern was really the same among the, among the four. So here under the most severe scenario at RCP 8.5, we see that now all of our Southern populations are especially vulnerable uh, in, the, in the south end of the range here. And we also see that overall our vulnerab uh, vulnerability values are much higher. So 
what we know is that under these higher emission scenarios, we see greater vulnerability overall. I again looked at the relationship between vulnerability and latitude and saw um, the, the same relationship, that as latitude increases, our populations become less vulnerable. Um, now, another thing I wanted to look at um, was to kind of look at the relationship between vulnerability and nucleotide diversity. And that's because you would sort of assume that populations that are less genetically diverse are probably more vulnerable to climate change. And that is in fact what we're seeing that as nucleotide diversity increases, our populations become less vulnerable. So this kind of aligns with what we know um, from the literature already. So these results were really interesting to us for a number of different reasons, but one of those reasons has to do with life history variation. So um, again, many people on this call are probably much more familiar with Arctic char than I am, or at least from being in Scotland are quite familiar with it. It is the most variable vertebrate, meaning that across its whole Arctic range, there are many, many different morphs of Arctic char. So the morphs that we're interested in are the, this migratory form and this non-migratory form. Uh, so the migratory form are the anadromous types that I've been looking at that go out to sea and they come back. And the non-migratory form are what we call the resident uh, populations. Now we don't have any genetic data for these resident populations in our study, but I just wanted to talk about them for just a second. So if you look at the map I'm showing you in red, that's the uh, distribution or the range for the migratory form of Arctic char. And what you can see is that the southern end of this um, range of the anadromous version is sort of here in northern Newfoundland. Now, the non-migratory form, it actually extends further south and it's found all the way down into Maine in the U.S. And what's interesting is we found that our southernmost populations then are actually at the very southern range limit for the anadromous form. And again, this kind of aligns with what we know or what we think about when we think about range edge dynamics. The fact that we know that gene flow is quite unbalanced between sort of the center of a range and peripheral populations. So often we see that populations at the range limits or at the periphery are less, less diverse or more or poorly adapted essentially. But this got me thinking about Okay, so we know that populations are vulnerable um, and we know that these vulnerable populations are at the southern range edge, but what does this mean for, or I guess, how does vulnerability really translate to loss or decline or probability of loss or decline? So one thing I really wanted to look at was just to look at environmental data for a second and sort of forget the genetic data for the time being. So this PCA, you don't need to worry about any of the population codes or any of the variables. I just want to talk about what the three different clusters are. So don't worry too much about what's on the actual uh, slide in terms of the codes. And again, this is all just environmental data. But what I wanted to look at first were the environmental conditions, the current environmental conditions for our 28 migratory populations in my study, uh, in our study, sorry. And that's in purple here on the right hand side of the PCA. I then wanted to look at the future environmental conditions for the same 28 populations in our study, and that's in pink here in the center of the PCA. And then what's in yellow are actually environmental conditions for six non-migratory populations that again, we do not have genetic data for, but they're populations that we know exist in uh, Quebec and Maine. And what we'll see is that there are these four pink populations that are overlapping in our yellow cluster. And what this is showing us is that these populations, which are actually uh, anadromous populations, these are the four that are most vulnerable, uh, that we show were most vulnerable in our previous analysis. And so what that's telling us is that the future environment of these southern vulnerable migratory populations is actually really similar to the current environment where only non-migratory populations exist and where anadromy has actually been lost at those locations. So that suggests to us that we may actually lose the anadromous form at the southern end of the range. Um, and this is quite worrisome for us because we know that in this particular area in northern Newfoundland and southern Labrador, that anadromous Arctic char really uh, form the basis of an important subsistence fisheries and are really important for indigenous food security. So um, we're certainly worried about this, that the potential loss of anadromy at these locations. <laughs> 
So again, I'm trying to get at this idea of, okay, so we know that populations are vulnerable are vulnerable, but how does that actually translate to a to risk of loss or risk of decline? So another thing we thought about looking at were, well, has there been evidence of past climate linked declines in this species? And so in the North Atlantic, uh, we know from this paper, but many other papers that in the early 1990s, there was a drop in temperature. And you can see that um, with the blue line on this plot. And uh, what we also noticed, not only was there this drop in temperature, but we also saw this, this paper by Eric Peterson and colleagues. They were also looking at signatures of collapse in this region at the same time. And they found that also in the early 1990s, there was a decline in community biomass. Now community biomass here represents biomass of 30 different ground fish species in the North Atlantic. And so we just replotted the data here, but that was quite interesting to us. It kind of got us thinking, okay, well, what was happening with Arctic char at the same time? Now, our co-author, Brian Dempson, who is a research scientist at Fisheries and Oceans Canada, he had data from uh, for Arctic char spanning back into the 70s. And so we looked at what was happening with the weight of Arctic char at this time. And then we also see that the weight of Arctic char declines in the early 1990s. So this kind of result in, uh, was telling us that, okay, maybe Arctic char have responded negatively in the past to climate impacts, but we wanted to go just one step further and try to use our genetic data to understand uh, and to estimate effective population size in the recent past to see if we could actually really detect a decline. So to estimate effective population size, we use the program LINK-ENI. It's a linkage-based uh, method for detecting and estimating effective population size. Uh, what you can see on this plot is that all of our 28 populations declined between our second and our third time point, which I've highlighted in this black box here. So don't worry too much about the different colors. The reason why three populations appear in red rather than gold uh, is because um, they have larger effective population size. So I've just plotted them on a second y-axis. But either way, the pattern is the same, that all of our populations have declined between that second and third time point, which is about 1990 and 2001. And if we look at the magnitude of that decline, we can see that on average, it represents about a 35% decline. So actually quite substantial. So kind of all of this evidence put together has suggested to us that Arctic char have responded negatively to climate impacts in the past and that there have been past climate linked declines in this species. So what is it that we know now after using this data uh, and these approaches to understand how Arctic char have and will respond to climate change? Well, we know that again, our Southern populations appear to be most vulnerable. Uh, I then also found that if we look at the future environment for these Southern populations, it most closely matches the current environment at locations where anadromy has already been lost. So that suggests to us that we could see a loss of anadromy and this loss of life history variation has potentially very serious impacts on indigenous food security in the region. We also showed that there have been past climate length declines in Arctic char and we saw a decline between about 1990 and 2001 in all of the 28 populations in our study. So you might have noticed from the previous slides um, that this work is currently in revision. Uh, we're hoping that it will see the light of day very soon. Um, but it's got me thinking about what we can do next with vulnerability and, and where I'd like to actually take this work. We're starting to see vulnerability pop up um, more frequently in the literature in the past year or so. And I think there's a lot of interesting things that can be done here. But I want to talk about um, two things quickly that I think could be applicable to Scottish systems in particular. So one thing I'm quite interested in understanding is parallel response patterns across the North Atlantic. So for species that are found on both sides of the Atlantic, do we see parallelism in the way that those populations are responding to climate change? I think that could be really interesting, not only for Arctic char, say, but I think there are a lot of other candidates um, that could be interesting to look at this. And I know there's some work in this area on terrestrial systems already. Another thing I think that could be great is to sort of expand this vulnerability analysis and really look at broad scale multi-species responses to get an idea of sort of ecosystem level vulnerability.
And I'm going to talk about this actually for just another minute or two, um, because it's a project I'm really interested in getting off the ground. Um, and maybe other people will be interested in as well. So I'd be happy to, to talk about that at any point. So I've always been very interested in rocky intertidal ecosystems. Um, I like to think that's probably because I'm Canadian and in order to actually get in the water here, you need to wear a dry suit. So you have really no choice but to love a rocky intertidal ecosystem. Um, but they are really unique and um, I've really enjoyed studying them in sort of different parts of the planet and, and getting to know them. And we know that obviously Scotland has some incredible rocky intertidal ecosystems that I can't wait to actually get a chance to see whenever that will be. Um, but the reason why I also think intertidal ecosystems are so interesting and really such a great candidate for this work is because we know that they're especially vulnerable to climate change. So we know that increasing temperatures and changing tides are really causing greater desiccation stress for the organisms that are living there. And so not only do we know that intertidal ecosystems are quite vulnerable, but when I think about, you know, candidate species within an intertidal ecosystem that I think are also quite vulnerable, I think immediately of sort of specialists. So species that require a particular microhabitat or a particular food source in order to survive. So we know that they're quite restricted and that they too are quite vulnerable to climate climate change. And when I think about an intertidal specialist that would be a really good candidate for this work, I immediately think of the sea lemon Doris pseudo argus. Um, this is a nudibranch mollusk or a sea slug. Um, I wish I could say that I just thought of this organically, but actually I've been studying nudibranchs for a number of years and they were sort of a central focus of my doctoral work. And although despite being kind of charismatic macrofauna, there are very valid reasons why I think these are interesting systems in ecology and evolutionary biology. Um, I mean, first and foremost, they steal chemicals, they're toxic, they're hermaphrodites, um, and they're just interesting systems all around. But I, I won't get into this being a trying to convince you why I think nudibranchs are interesting, but I think in this context, they're quite neat because we know that Doris pseudo argus feeds exclusively on sponge. And from some work in sort of the 60s and the 70s, it's thought that it feeds almost exclusively on just the breadcrumb sponge helichondria. So the idea that we see this tight coupling between predator and prey, I think could be a really good candidate. I think if we want to understand how something like the sea lemon or any other specialist is really responding to climate change, we need to understand how its prey is also responding and actually look at this in sort of a coupled approach. I think there's also an interesting opportunity here um, to look at a kind of comparative system. There's a second intertidal nudibranch called Catalina Leves or the White Atlantic Catalina. Um, it's also found in intertidal ecosystems alongside the sea lemon. And what's interesting about these two is they're found again across these really steep environmental gradients. So they range from about Norway down to the Mediterranean. Um, so again, a really good area to start looking at genotype environment relationships. We know that Catalina is also a sponge feeder, but it feeds on a different species of encrusting sponge, it's Halasarca. Uh, but again, I think there'd be an interesting opportunity here to do a comparative framework. And I especially think this is interesting because we know the sea lemon Doris has a planktonic mode of larval development, whereas Catalina is actually a direct developer. Um, this is actually the only nudibranch in the region that we know that has direct development. So that's quite interesting in and of itself. But I think there's a really cool opportunity here to start linking life history variation and climate vulnerability uh, across the range. So uh, now that I've sort of managed to kind of sneak some slug talk into the, <laughs> into the end of my Arctic char talk, I do want to end off kind of on how I started. And that's to say that to preserve biodiversity, we need to understand how species will respond to climate change. And I, and I hope I've sort of shown you that today and how important it is to understand that. But I think um, in order to preserve biodiversity, it's also really important that we continue to discover and document biodiversity on our planet. So of course, you know, we're undergoing this global biodiversity crisis where we're losing species before we're actually able to document them. And this is something that I'm pretty passionate about and that's been a central focus of my research for the last 10 years or so. Um, and because of this, and as I mentioned before, I've been involved with the International Barcode of Life program since about 2009. And we're in sort of a second phase of this project called Bioscan, where we're actually trying to document all multicellular life on the planet using next-gen barcoding. Um, so if this is something that you're involved in on the call or you want to get involved in or you want more information about, feel free to reach out. But I just wanted to 
do a little plug for Bioscan because I just can't stress how important it is that we actually know what's on our planet in order to preserve that. So I'm just gonna finish up by thanking all of the funders of the Arctic Char work. And I wanna again, thank all of the co-authors of that work. They've been an incredible group that have really taught me so much about Arctic Char. Um, and I, I'm just very thankful for that. And then here I've listed some uh, individuals and organizations that again, have been really instrumental in seeing that project come to fruition. Um, I've just put my contact details out there. Again, I'm, I'm really thrilled to become part of the Scottish Marine Science community, and I'm really open uh, for collaboration and to work on many different systems. I just wanted to summarize my interests there again, because they are quite broad. Um, a couple other projects that I'm working on alongside understanding climate change vulnerability and sort of climate change genomics is continuing to discover biodiversity, like I just mentioned. And I'm also really interested in mimicry, ecological speciation and hybridization, um, mostly in nudibranchs. Um, but I'm looking forward to kind of continuing work in other marine invertebrate systems and in Arctic char and other salmonids as well. So I'll just thank Hannah and Mass for giving me the opportunity to speak today and thank you so much for coming out to the webinar. Excellent, Cara, that was a really great talk. Um, so anyone who's interested uh, in talking to Cara, her details are on the screen, but right now it's our Q&A session. So if you have a question you'd like to ask Cara directly right now, uh, please use the Q&A box that is just below your screen if you're using Zoom, or you can put it in the chat if you're joining us through YouTube. We already have a question submitted. So Cara, if you can open that up, we'll just jump right into that. Uh, the question is from Andrew and it says the RDA1 represented about 80% of the genetic variation and explained as owing to latitudinal and temperature related differences. Did RDA2 represent most of the remaining variation? And if so, any thoughts of the underpinning mechanisms behind this? Uh, that's quite an in-depth question. That, yeah, that's <laughs> a great question, Andrew. Thank you for that. That's a great question. Um, so it, it represented about seven or eight percent of the variation. And, and it's actually interesting that you asked that because we've always been perplexed um, by this sort of U shape in our RDA such that on RDA axis two, we then see that our northernmost and sort of southernmost populations become quite similar. And so we're still trying to tease apart um, why that might in fact be. We know that in Arctic char, I should say, that there are five different uh, glacial lineages that, are, that originate from different glacial refugia. And we think that this is um, driving sort of a secondary signal in the data. Excellent. We actually have a question uh, from Sylvia who would like to ask her question live. So I'm just going to allow her to talk. Great. Hi, Sylvia. Oh, hi. Okay, go ahead. Hi, Tara. Thank you for the, um, for the presentation. It was really interesting. Actually, I have a couple of questions. And sure. the first one is, uh, like, I started the, 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 same, the same problem uh, for my master, but then there are different point of view because, uh, like, our professor he was like uh, Hans Otto Portman. I don't know if you know him by name or whatever, but he was um, he made like a series of uh, physiological experiment, but he came to the same conclusion, like very likely in this like uh, um, ocean warming scenario, we will likely use like some. Uh, like population of uh, the salmon species that I think I, it was Chinook, I'm not sure. So like at the end of uh, like this series of paper, he concluded that the only way to prevent uh, uh, this loss that is anyway unlikely, uh, the only thing that we could do would be, for instance, installing some more like uh, fish ladders or maybe like managing the fisheries to not stress like this like weaker populations and i don't know if you came to any other conclusion instead of just mm -hmm. just waiting for for the the events to come uh. yeah i think that's a great point and actually it's something we're thinking about at the moment because um in our revisions that's something that sort of come up is the idea well can you put forth any sort of conservation management strategies that you think would be effective um it's not something that we've currently suggested, but it's certainly something that kind of we're talking about and trying to consider at the time. What what can we say or what can we do that we think would help this situation and and hope you know I don't know if remedy is the right word, but maybe try to alleviate this um, or slow this sort of event from happening. I guess, but I think that's a great point. There are there are certainly ways that you can mitigate this sort of loss. Yeah. Uh... 
okay so yeah it's it's pretty difficult i guess and and the other one was uh uh if how do you assess the stock in rivers like do you have surveys or just other types of sampling or you sample them when they are in the sea Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I should have actually mentioned that too. Um, there was a, a paper that we did prior to this work, sort of early on in my postdoc, where we were um, looking at actually doing mixed stock identification using the uh, microsatellite and SNP data, actually, and trying to understand the structure of these stocks across the range. Um, so I think, I mean, I, I hope I'm not misspeaking here, but um, Every year, so the data we had um, where we had gone out and collect, uh, collected juveniles from the actual rivers. And then we also had data from the fisheries out at sea. So we were really trying to connect the individuals we were collecting in the fishery and trying to collect their, or uh, identify their river of origin, essentially. Uh, but we do have counting fences in place. And actually some of the work that we did in that first paper doing that um, genetic mixed stock identification was trying to understand where we should put counting fences based on how they're contributing to those fisheries. Um, so yeah, there are still counting fences. Um, and actually I think a new one going in place in the Fraser region. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sylvia. Thanks, Sylvia. Uh, right, our next question is coming in through the Q&A box uh, where you can submit any other questions if anyone still has something that they would like to ask. Uh, it comes from David and it is, what sorts of biological processes are associated with the SNPS, uh, SNPs? Uh, that is, what sorts of biology is potentially evolvable or on the other hand, not evolvable and hence at a pinch point for vulnerability? Wow, that's an interesting question. Uh, yeah, that's an interesting question. So um, I guess uh, when I showed the environmentally associated SNPs and the process that we think they're involved in, so that was when I actually uh, looked at the genes they were located near and what those genes are actually doing. But we also did um, some other gene ontology work to look at what biological processes were kind of linked to these environmentally associated SNPs. And some of that work um, showed that, you know, things like um, water and temperature homeostasis were really important. Um, we saw that there were a lot of uh, immune functions that looked to be quite important. Um, and then there were quite a few that were um, involved, again, in metabolism is quite often lipid metabolism. Obviously, the idea that you're metabolizing, metabolizing lipids differently across a, such a steep environmental gradient where temperatures change so dramatically. Um, but I think that's an interesting thing to think about what sort of processes are sort of a pinch point for vulnerability. I hadn't um, I'm not sure I really thought about it in that in that particular uh, context before. I know when we think about climate change um, and salmonids, we certainly think about um, differences in phenology and how this might impact migration timing and spawn timing and all those sorts of things. And so, um, you know, maybe trying to link some of the processes we're finding in this gene ontology work and looking at, again, SNPs that are located near these genes and uh, trying to think how that could be linked um, to climate change or, or changes in phenology. Thank you. Um, moving on to our next question. It is from Abigail and says, would the genomic methods applied in this study be the most effective when used in other kinds of marine environments, in your opinion? Yeah, I think that's a great question, Abigail. Um, I think uh, in this particular environment, it's really interesting because it's such a steep climb. Um, but I'm, you know, I'm, I think it has to be, uh, I think you have to think sort of about the type of marine system environment or kind of taxonomic system that you're actually looking at. I know in this case, of course, a lot of the method, methods that we're using, uh, we have a reference genome for. So one thing I usually mention in my talks is the fact that I've worked mostly on marine invertebrates and we're incredibly limited by the fact that we don't have reference genomes. So it kind of limits the type of analysis we're doing here where we can actually, you know, look at SNPs on particular chromosomes and, and we can do this linkage based estimate of effective population size. So I think in terms of of the marine uh, taxonomic system, it's quite difficult to apply these particular methods right now to some of the invertebrates that we're interested in. Um, but I think, yeah, right now, this particular area is so interesting because we have that steep climb and we can see that matched on the other side of the Atlantic between Norway and, and kind of the Mediterranean where 
other animals are often found on that same steep sort of client. So I think it's worth considering whether you have that clonal variation there um, to kind of pick up these patterns, I guess. But I think, yes, I think the idea is that this method can be used quite broadly. That's good to know. Um, so our next question kind of refers to the fact that you've said, you know, you've got a huge broad range of interests, uh, particularly in the intertidal <laughs> systems. And our next question is, uh, any interest or work uh, involving algae? Yeah, definitely. So I'm interested in a lot of things that feed on and uh, live alongside algae. So I think absolutely. And I actually think when you're you know, if we look at applying this sort of ecosystem vulnerability approach, it would only make sense to include things like algae and do kind of looking at different trophic levels and really doing a top-down approach. So I think that would be excellent. Yeah. And with that, uh, we haven't got any more questions to answer right now. So if anyone does have any burning questions, please pop them in the Q&A box right now. But uh, thank you so much, Kara, for our uh, today's talk and we welcome you into the masks community even though you're still in Canada don't worry you'll be here shortly and I should also mention you're a member of our latest and newest uh, masks forum which is the climate change forum uh, so you'll be involved in that as well and um, yeah thank you very much for today's talk I don't think we're getting anything else in so we're going to be ending just before our scheduled end at two o'clock so thank you very much thank you so much Hannah and thanks everyone for tuning in I really appreciate it and I should just say for anyone else who is still uh in this session we have loads of other great talks coming up uh that uh you know Cara's been today was Cara's masks webinar and uh these are our next coming talks if you are interested in attending any of those as well as that Q&A session, please just use the registration link that you use to join in on this one and you'll be able to join those webinars there. So uh, as it says on the screen, we are looking for a speaker for the 29th of July, but if there's a date in August that you would like to present on, please email us as well. We're happy to have webinars in August as well. Um, and we hope to, that you can join us in any of our future webinars. So thank you very much.